A következő egy órát megint Michael-nál fogjuk tölteni. Most nincs előadás, prezentáció, hanem inkább kérdések lesznek. Remélhetőleg nem csak tőlem, hanem tőletek is. Megint meg, mindjárt megérkezik ez a bizonyos kocka mikrofon, amit lehet dobálni, meg lehet megkapni a kolléganőktől. Tegyetek fel minél több kérdést, legyetek szívesek itt élőben is, de persze változatlanul működik a slide felület, úgyhogy aki szívesebben kérdez rajtam keresztül, az tegye meg. Én látom, itt vannak a kezemben a kérdéseitek, és azokat is föl fogom tenni Michaelnek. Akit köszöntsetek ismét sok szeretettel, Michael Bellé. I am Groot. <laughs> Great, I can see that. Most people have seen the film. Did you enjoy it? Hands up for people who have seen the film and enjoyed and know who Groot is. I am Groot. <laughs> <laughs> and now we'll carry on like this for the next hour. Okay, great. That was a good way to get you moving. We have some questions uh, already on Slido. We have hopefully some questions in the audience. I would like the first person to have a question to put their hand up and get the microphone so it gets to you in time. But before we get into all of that, I must ask you myself, I've heard that allegedly you have a slightly more unorthodox approach to lean than most. Allegedly. Allegedly. It's a very complicated word. It's easier. <laughs> I am Why very I orthodox. <laughs> it's their problem that they don't know what lean is. <laughs> How would you define your unorthodoxy? I'm not unorthodox. They're unorthodox. <laughs> How would you define the difference? They're confused. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> okay, you've had a workshop. Lean is the reason we invented. Does anybody know the origin, the first word, they, when, when Jim and Dan and the other guys are the team of the IMVP project, so those of you who've been in Lean a long time, you've heard about this. Who has read Machine That Changed the World? Yeah, not that many. Hey, read the books, guys. Don't come to the conference. Start with reading books, yeah? So if you read the book, they went and they discovered that Toyota back in the late 80s was superior to all their competitors, not on one dimension, but on all. It was a bit of a shock. They didn't expect it at all. So when they started writing about what it was that made Toyota superior, which is the book, they needed a name. And the first name they thought of was, does anybody know this? Yeah, I heard it. Fragile. Fragile production. Because the idea is that the line stops all the time. But they thought this is not going to sell. It's probably a better descriptive book than Lean, but it's not going to sell. So um, one of the guys, John Kravchik, came up with the name Lean. Now this was a stroke of completely accidental genius. It does not translate into any known language. The word lean is very particular to American or English. It means the greyhound is lean. It means fast, flexible, lean. So they branded a global movement by accident. The point of that story is that lean was born out of trying to understand how the Toyota model was superior to every other automotive model. That's what orthodoxy means. So you have two directions in what you do. You either still now try to understand better what Toyota did and is continuing to do, and then try to understand, figure out how it applies to your circumstances. So this is a movement direction, which is what I'd call orthodox. Or you can move the other direction and say, whatever I'm doing now, which is usually old-fashioned Taylorism, Let's call it lean because it looks better on your slides. So there's nothing unorthodox by my position. Is there anything that I say in my workshops or in the talk or in my books that isn't already in Machine That Changed the World or Lean Thinking? Anything. So how am I an orthodox? 
<laughs> this is ridiculous. Do you think that being French gives you a slightly different perspective? Being from, French. From the American lean authors whose books people would have probably already read. Being French gives me the God-given right to be rude to anybody I want to. <laughs> does it help with lean? Yes, no, no, you're absolutely right. Um, oh yeah, it does, actually. <laughs> no, actually, you're absolutely right. Again, um, one of the biggest shocks in my life was I, I, I started visiting Tulip Plants. And most of the people think, okay, lean comes from Toyota, so we're moving towards understanding Toyota. But then, usually the people who talk about Toyota talk about their Toyota plant. And I started visiting Toyota plants around the world and realizing they were completely different. And I still remember being in China in a plant that had two different lines with two different model plants. So I don't know if you know this, but traditionally it's not so true anymore, but when Toyota started a new line, they would take the best guys from their plant and send them around the world. And they had to take the toughest criteria industrially, and they were tasked to build a new line with this. So every plant outside of Japan has a mother plant in Japan. Do you see the system? So here there were a big, huge site in China, and there were two different lines with two mother, different mother plants. And I had just visited one, and I visited the second, and it's completely different. It's just completely different. All the principles are there, but you know the uniforms are different, the slogans are different. One is the low-range car, so it's all about cost-cutting. The other is a high-range car, so it's all about superior quality. You know, it's just completely different. So it dawned on me that we were completely missing something about lean, which is we only know the lean from the guy from the Toyota plant that they come from. So yes, I come from different tradition from the Americans because Toyota established a Toyota plant very early in France, which is very different from the Numi and Kentucky plants. These are different senseis from different mother plants that took care of them. Um, I had the good fortune of meeting uh, Mr. Yoshino, who, who was the architect of the Numi experience in the States. And from my tradition is another, another guy called Mr. Hayashi, and really very different characters with different focus. So there's not one lean, or for that matter, there's not one way to express TPS. It's your intent, your efforts to understand TPS in your circumstances that makes it lean. Um, this is like Tai Chi or all these things. There is no doing Tai Chi. There is only learning Tai Chi. There's no doing lean. There's only learning lean. So from that point of view, yes, this is a bit surprising for because most of the books and most of the trainings you will have will have come from the American tradition of Numi, Kentucky, and these plants where I have studied a different branch. One last word on this. this is a, you have not done lean for real until you have lived through battle of the sensei. Anybody here has lived through Battle of the Sensei? This is an initiation, initiation ritual in Lean. Nobody? Ah, uh, well, I'm sorry, guys. So none of these guys have really done you Lean? Have, you have? OK, so Battle of the Sensei is where we, you were two Senseis on the same line. And they start disagreeing about everything. The only thing that they agree on is that you're an idiot. <laughs> But this is very, very interesting. So, so the, the moment you start really getting that this is something else that you thought is when you see Battle of the Sensei, is very, very, this is an initiation ritual. Unless you have lived through the Battle of the Sensei, you, you haven't yet, there is room for improvement. This brings me to a question on Slido, although I do Hi, still... Hello, Slido. Who's Slido? Come on, don't be shy, Slido. Show I, up. I would still like you guys to put your hands up and get that cube, and as soon as I know that that cube is in someone's hand, you'll get the opportunity to ask a question. But someone has already asked the question on Slido, how do I find the sensei? Your problem. <laughs> <laughs> how much? Like, what is this? Kindergarten? I mean, come on. Lean is a method to make you more competitive. So, hey, you took all our machines, you went to France and you said, guys, we'll take all your machines because we're cheaper, and once you have all the machines, haha, <laughs> good luck for getting it back. That worked. It worked so much that your, your labor costs are going up, and there are guys in the East that are cheaper than you. So wake up, smell the coffee, join the party. 
not so easy, yeah? So now, lean is about being more competitive. More competitive. Why do you think it should be easy? It's not. It's not about teaching you all, it's about distinguishing those of you who want it enough. So this is the same story as with Tai Chi. You go to, you read the book, it's cool, you watch Karate Kid, it's wonderful. You go to the park and you practice and you come to the conference. And you say, why not? Then you go to the private workshop session. Then you beg the sensei to give you a one-on-one -on -one lesson. Then at some point the sensei says, oh, now you're too good for me. You need to go up the mountain and learn from the master who taught me. This is how it works. So yes, senseis are rare. What defines a sensei is their line of tradition. What defines a sensei is whether they have their sensei, and, and you can have the combo link all the way back to Tai Chi Ono, so you know where you are. But the point is, how much energy do you put in? How much do you invest in your own learning? So there is no how you find a sensei. This is part of your learning journey. Now on slide. I, I, told, I told you they wouldn't like my answers. It's not, you know, everybody says, oh, you lean guys never have answers. Yeah, I have answers. It's just that they look at them. They don't like them. Well, we have a question in a second, but um, I would like you to know that we also have comments on slide and not just questions. And someone, anonymous, thinks you look like Tom Hanks. Now, whether that's a compliment or not, or whether you think that's a sign of them not liking your answers, I don't know. Uh, and we have a question from the audience. I'm happy to, to, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I did. <laughs> it's probably making a bit more than I do. <laughs> it didn't. It didn't. He, he didn't specify which film. So hopefully not Forrest Gump. <laughs> run, Forrest, run! <laughs> And the question. Just a sec, you will get a cue in a minute. <laughs> so, uh, Michael, you, you told us that there is no doing lean, just learning lean, right? And you also Are you holding a cube in your hand? What? That was very strange. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> See? <laughs> okay. I don't like the way I'm holding the cube. No, it's just okay. It's okay. Anyway. <laughs> so, you also challenged us. <laughs> you know, how, um, how we should think about our, our own learning and internalize uh, things for ourselves. So I would be curious, could you share with us a little bit about your own learning curve? Like, um, or where are you, or what are things you are trying to learn currently? That's a rather personal question. I think I resent that. <laughs> But it's pretty simple. I was doing. I was studying for my PhD um, what Toyota was doing in, in one of my father's plants and didn't understand everything. Anything. What happened is I kept saying to the guys, "Listen, I can see you making this line improve so much. Um, can you give me the roadmap? What's your plan? How do you do this?" And they say, "We we don't have a roadmap." And I say, "Come on, come on. I understand you don't want to share it because this is competitive advantage. But this is just for my research, for my doctorate." We don't have a robot. We just solve one problem after the other. Oh, come on, guys. Come on, give it to me. Come on. And then we say, we don't have a roadmap. We do have a golden rule that in order to make products, we make people. I went, oh, what? So then I started as a sociologist. It was like incredible. So then I devoted my entire career to studying one sentence. In order to make products, we first make people. And then I realized after seven years, I was studying half a sentence, which is how to make people. So then I have to spend the rest of the time studying the other half of the sentence, which is how do we make products? So in terms of learning curve, then I learned to work. And then they told me, you can't intellectualize this. You have to do this. So I started working as a subcontractor to a consultant. Back in the day, we used to break the factory in a week, move the machines on the night of the Wednesday. The factory would never start again. It, it was very interesting. I was a kid. So I worked with supervisors. Then I loved to work with plant managers. I loved to work with CEOs of small companies. I'm working with CEOs of bigger companies now. So it's, it's progression. But the big thing was moving away from production into engineering in order to make products we make people. And this is the thing that you guys, m not you guys, most lean guys just simply don't get. 
try to explain a tree if you don't know the tree has roots and sap. So you will say, look, hey, you have branches and the leaves go around the branches, you know? And the branches have all these complex, ridiculous relationship between each other. Well, this is, yes, this is true, but the truth is that the tree looks like a tree because it has roots and sap. Is this getting lost in translation or does it work in Hungarian? It works. So everything you see in production is a reflection of Toyota's product range choices and manufacturing engineering decisions. So this is what we see in production. Where Toyota is confusing and very smart is that a lot of their product evolution choices come from what they learn from the improvements in production. So contrarily to most of your companies, the, they are separated between engineering, manufacturing, engineering, and in production and supply chain. But these separations are far more connected, usually through personal relationships, than in any other company. So that's the big thing, that once you've seen it in terms of learning curve. So where I'm now, I'm, my work with CEOs, most of my problems is product, product design problems, which is what kind of decisions we make on the product range and what is the next step for the product, which is where is the technical learning curve we have to, it has nothing to do with the stuff we did in the workshop. Guys, you know, you do this in the first couple of years and done, enough. The interesting thing is what are the technical learning curve that comes out of this and are we learning the right stuff? So where I still struggle massively, because I'm just as confused as everybody else, is how do we learn the right stuff? For instance, Long, sorry, long answer. Uh, right now, digital is a reality. Digital is not about digitizing things. This is, a, okay, so what? Digital is understanding the connectivity between products and the platform environment. So uh, right now, I'm very, very busy trying to figure out how do you fit products within a product platform and what exactly digital brings, what it means. Uh, again, Toyota is working on the same things as well. So. That it's, it's a difficult question. Can I have an easy question now? Well, the gentleman in the back has the cue. Can you make? Oh, no, it no, he's not. No, can somebody you make it else. An easy question, please. <laughs> not again. Uh, haven't we seen this movie before? <laughs> Hi, Michael. Hi. We know we know each other from yesterday, <laughs> and uh, it will touch learning also. So actually, uh, we learn from our mistakes. So thank you for learning something yesterday. But I also would like to ask you. Uh, if you would like to learn something, we will make some mistakes. What were your mistakes that turned you to the way that you, can, you know how to do things right? I hope it's easy enough. <laughs> well, my first mistake was not understanding that the reason Toyota was doing what it, uh, what it was doing was for the engineering of the product of the next generation. Just complete it. The second mistake is thinking that Toyota was teaching us a model line, which turned out a very costly mistake. Very, very costly mistake. I, I was not alone in making that mistake. Whereas, in fact, Toyota was using one line to educate the senior guys, which is a very bad mistake here. It costs us, you know, wow, it's still costing. You still have idiots. Hey, people still come to me wanting to do roadmaps. Now, roadmaps, do you, who has roadmaps in their program? Nobody has roadmaps? <laughs> Maturity audits on roadmaps, nobody? You're too shy, yeah? Okay, ask the question on Slido. On Slido, they'll answer. So who has roadmaps? <laughs> now, roadmaps were invented by my father with a consultant. I was there. I still have the original roadmaps. They were learning so much stuff, they didn't know how to organize it. And one day they had this great idea. They would say, let's take top it by top of it, and let's take maturity levels, yeah? Roadmap. So then we can give it the roadmap to everybody so they can apply. Never worked. Not one single time. It was very useful for them as a way to codify the, language, the learning they were using, but it was only useful for the guys who wrote the roadmaps. Then we go and give the roadmaps to other people to apply, and what happened? What happens with the roadmap when you give it to people to apply? Nothing. So what is amazing is that in 2017, there are still people Producing roadmaps, it's, it's, it's a whole, there's a whole industry of consultants and bureaucrats that write roadmaps for people in order to fail faster. It's amazing. So that was a very big mistake. 
uh, other mistakes. Very big mistake. Um, when I started working, when my father retired, I stopped being a professor. This was not a mistake. I realized I didn't like my students. I don't like people I don't know. I don't like you. You're all ugly. So I didn't like my students, and as opposed to most professors, I stopped teaching. <laughs> the professors my kids have, they don't like their students, but they're still teaching. It's a disaster. So I started consulting with my dad, and he said, pool system, pool system, pool system. And I, I didn't know how to set up a pool system. So I said, no, come on. You know, we get them to solve their problems. We develop them. You know, remember that half of the sentence I had just spent seven years studying, so I was pretty cool on this, you know. And then um, I realized that with just doing the problem solving without the pool system, you always have to put energy back in the system. It's never stable. So at some point, uh, we, we completely messed up one company with this. And at some point, I said, OK, fine. I'll learn how to set up a pool system. So I went to pool system. So again, now I know better that if you're not setting up a pool system, whatever you're doing is probably great, but it's just not lean. Because the pool system is not about pooling. It's about revealing the value analysis opportunities that lead you to value engineering. So once you do the pool system, suddenly it all becomes clear. So that, that was a pretty big mistake. So what do you do when you realize that you've completely messed up a company? Try to do, you move on. <laughs> Before they notice? No, you tell them, sorry. <laughs> they, they, you know, they're usually pretty messed up, so they, you know, they have all the problems. You know, some boss always changes, and, you know, <laughs> something always happens. So yeah, you move on. No, it's pretty clear the people I work with, they understand we don't know everything. They're, it's, it, it, there's a misunderstanding about the sensor role. I think that might be interesting for you guys, the sensei question. The senseis are not coaching you. They're not teaching you anything. The senseis are showing you what is important for you to learn. So they show you things, and it's completely up to you to learn. That's your cop out when you mess up a company? Exactly. OK, fair enough. Bye. <clears throat> you wanted an easier question, so here's one from Slido. Oh, just, just to finish on this. Um, Messing up on production, hey, what can possibly happen that you can't recover in a night shift or a weekend shift? Yeah, it's production. Messing up in product development, you're, this is, this is, you can be gambling in the company. What so, if the so lean principles get applied to a hospital? That's actually pretty, pretty easy. People don't want to do it, but actually in the hospital it's pretty easy because it turns out that, it, you know, last time I was in hospital, <laughs> okay, you have to see the scene. Um, I'm in a hospital, there's the hospital director, a very smart lady, there's the, in, the guy who's in charge of emergencies, very good doctor, there's the lean guy, and we're watching a patient and this lady is on a bed, on a stretcher, and she wants to tell the nurse about the cerebral incident she had a few months ago, so she wants to talk. And the nurse is turning her back to her, looking at the screen on the wall. What did you say your address was? Ouch. So we were, the th all four of us looking at our shoes thinking, uh. So uh, people say, you know, in the hospital, come on, there's no cars. And the really painful thing about hospitals is that Toyota treats their cars better than we treat patients. <laughs> so hospitals are not actually that hard. Too lean. Yeah, no, no, it's actually, it's because people want to do a good job. So once you get the, the problem are the bosses, but once you get the bosses out of the way, most people in the hospital, they really want to do a good job. So, so it's pretty easy to get going. Okay, so I guess the next question is kind of relevant. How can you involve your employees to think about waste reduction if all day long they think about their private problems, their physical and social needs? Be more interesting. You're just not interesting enough. You know, literally, if they're thinking about their problem at home, it's because you're not interesting enough. Uh, one of the guys of the next book I'm writing with, uh, it, so I'm writing a book with Dan Jones and Ari Fiume. You might have come across Ari, the lean accounting guy, no? 
the guy who started the lean accounting movement, and a CEO. And this CEO, uh, I worked with him for many years, but in France he was known as a very, very progressive CEO. He was involved with all these progressive CEO things. And he actually thought he was doing every progressive policy you could do in France. And he didn't understand why his employees were more just as disengaged as everywhere else, just as complaining, always going to the union. And it took us a while doing lean that they realized that if you convince people that their life is outside, why should they commit to the company? So the trick is not, it's if you understand they have all these problems outside, how do you make them for them easier to be inside the company? How do you make it more interesting? How do you make it more rewarding? How do you, how do you facilitate the work? If they have all sorts of problems at home and they come to your company and nothing helps them and doing the simplest thing is a bureaucratic nightmare and they don't have the tools to do the job, what can you do? So I think the important concept here is enabling. This is your job as managers. How do you create enabling conditions where employees can do an interesting and positive and rewarding work at work? And then they forget, the work has to be somewhere where they forget about their life problems because it's interesting. So if you have that kind of problem, it's simply you're not interesting enough and you're not working hard enough to make the processes they work with enabling and not hindering. Someone says, we all know that tools and people go hand in hand, but if you did have to choose just one, which one is more important for success? One what? Either tools or people. If you had to choose between tools and people, which one is more important for success? All right, stand up. What do we have in mind? What a strange question. <laughs> now, what do you mean? I mean, the guy who asked this, or lady, I can, I can sense there's a real question here, but I have no idea what you mean. Okay, so maybe ask the question a different way, although I swear it wasn't me. How would you prior, prioritize? Let me think about that. All right. And by the way, the cube is still there and up for grabs. So if anyone wants to ask a question in person, because you see how nice Michael is being to all the people who ask questions. I'm thinking. Okay, can I think for a second? Thank you. I always wanted to do the Peter Capaldi thing. Shh, shut the fuck it up. On stage. Isn't wonderful. I'm so glad I could help. <laughs> to fill a fantasy. Come on, give her another clap. Come on, come on. By the way, whoever has the question, this is a sign that you've done really well because Michael is so embarrassed he can't answer it. No, it's just a so such a fucking dumb question. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right, here is the, the, the um, it's an it's completely stupid question, but it's stupid in a very understandable and nasty way and you must really all listen to you because tr chances are that the, the person asking this question is probably representing all of you. You're probably all doing this. What does problem solving mean? How do you solve a problem? Well, you, all, you all agree that lean is about problem solving, yeah? Yeah, hands, agreements, problem solving, you all hear this, you read the books, problem solving, yeah, everybody agrees, problem solving. No, not everybody agrees. So, problem solving. What does problem solving mean? If you, add, if you add one layer of quality control, are you solving the problem? You are. It is less defects. If you change the process, because the process is broken and you change the process to make it better, are you solving the problem with a better process? Mm hmm. If you add more checklists within the process, are you solving the problem? If you put more audits in the process. So, this is probably what you do, all of you, at work every day. You probably think that solving the problem is solving the problem in a bureaucratic way. Solving the problem in a bureaucratic way means changing the process on paper, adding audits, adding checks, adding controls. And you can add layers of people to make sure that these controls are in place. Even you as a journalist, I'm sure that you, suddenly your 
rather than be a great journalist, your head boss has processes and protocols and budgets and there are people to control that your boss is applying this and people to control that your boss is applying, that they're applying this. Yeah? We're, all doing, we're all doing this. This is a complete misunderstanding what it means solving a problem in Lean. Solving a problem in Lean is giving the person who has the problem the concrete reference points and analysis tool so that they can solve the problem themselves. Are you following me? Solving a quality problem doesn't mean changing the process. It means showing the operator the boundary conditions between good and not good telling them what the standard method should be so they, they can identify themselves where in the standard work they're not doing it right. Standard work is not a prison, it's not a procedure, it's not a process. It's a reference point. It's not the stone of the hill of the PDCA. It's the flag on the hill of how we should do it better. The ideal way of doing it. So you give people concrete visual reference points, you give people um, the ideal way of doing it so that they can themselves see where it's going wrong, what they're doing wrong, what they can change or what should be changed. Okay, Do you, are you with me? So that's why the question doesn't make sense because a tool is only the analysis method you give to people so that they learn to solve the problem themselves. There is no distinction between tool and people. The printing press would never have succeeded without the idea of personal theology. The telescope has no interest if we're not looking for heliocentric systems. The internet is just a curiosity. If somebody doesn't want to connect every web page to every other web page, the, every tool only makes sense because of the idea people have of it and what they do with it. Conversely, and this is what happened to me when I you know, had this problem, burned this company with, Having the idea without the tool doesn't get you anywhere. So you can't separate, in Lean, you can't separate the tool from the person. And the deeper point here, and this is why it's so confusing for many people, is that you we tend to consider, we tend to separate study of work on one hand. Oh, come on, who's done work study here? Oh, you guys, come on, you're professional work studyers. No, you're not. I'm very confused about this. Are we in the right conference? <laughs> I think so. I mean, they're getting all your lean jokes. Okay, that's, that's a good point. So, you, you mean there are people here who have not done work study? So, there is work study on one hand, and then we tend to think HR on the other. So, we have motivation questions and so forth. So, on one hand, we have people, and then on one hand, we have work. Yeah? Do you see it? The lean trick is that we don't separate these two. We, what we look at is the relationship people have with their work. Then we look at the relationship this work has with their customer. So we, th this notion of separation, it, it doesn't make sense. What we're trying to see is how the people themselves are engaged in their work, how interested they are, how creative they are, and then do they really understand the impact of their work on their customer? The relationship again. So in Lean, um, in order to understand that one and one makes two, you also have to understand and. So this is where Lean is looking at. So, 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 so actually, so I, I take back the stupid question comment. Um, it's, it's actually a very deep question. It's a complete misunderstanding. We do not separate tools from people just the way we do not separate work from motivation. What we look at in Lean is the relationship each single person has with their work and then how they, they see the relationship with their customers. Does that, does that make sense? Are they always that quiet? They're thinking. Oh, okay. Mm. They're processing. Or is that your saying. thinking face? <laughs> Absolutely. So what do you, you do? You look like Finns for a moment. Huh? Now, Finns are really quiet. 
So you go around the world and you work with CEOs and obviously that means you work with the companies and the factories. What do you do when you discover a situation where the people who work there have a bad relationship to their work and they're not particularly motivated? Does this ever happen? <laughs> Well, who has read the, it happens in Hungary. Uh, uh, yeah, I can see. Uh, who has read the lean, uh, the lead with respect? So you know that you know what we do. You have a conversation with our boss, and you say the problem is you. And the boss says, "What do you mean, me, the company? No, no, no. you, you as a person." This is the conversation yeah, you have with the yeah, CEOs. Yeah, who yeah. So I said, "Look at your guys. Yeah, they're useless guys, and so forth. Look at them. No, no. The problem is." You. It's an interesting conversation. <laughs> so what happens in the one time out of ten where you don't get fired the next day? No, I work with the CEO, so it's a bit complicated because you're next to the CEO and you're looking at the guy and say the problem is new. And the CEO is going, mm -hmm. Oh, I thought that you actually tell the CEO this. Some of the oh, problems. yeah, I tell the CEO that as well. But they know Does that. Does that work? So they say, yes, I know the problem is new. <laughs> Hey, listen, guys, it's, it's pretty cool. Um, again, w let's go back to the presentation this morning. We have fixed mindset people, and then we're screwed, whatever we do. And we have growth mindset people. Growth mindset people, it's cool. All of these conversations are pretty cool. What happens is sometimes in large companies, you end up with a fixed mindset guy who's going to go crazy and you just, what do you do, actually? You just move on and go and talk to somebody else. It's okay, companies are large, you, you find people you can work with. This story of the problem is you is actually a real story. Um, there's a, a good friend in South Africa, so the South African plant gets bought up by Toyota. There was already an automotive plant. And the guy, who, the guy I know there who's in charge of the whole logistics operation, um, explains to his sensei, so Toyota sends a sensei, and the sensei comes in, <laughs> Sensei face. And it, the guy explains, you, this is South Africa. South Africa, look at the guys I have to work with. Come on, this is South Africa. And then the sensei says, no, the problem is you. So that's where I got it for the book. It's a real conversation. And the guy's a big, so okay, imagine small Japanese sensei, big South African guy, with a beard. It's like, what do you mean? The problem is me. Look at the guys I have to work with. And the sensei listens and says, mm -hmm. I come back from Australian plant. You have it easy here. <laughs> <laughs> so the interesting part of the story is not told in the book, which is after this conversation that didn't go so well, the sensei just left. Nothing happened. Two years later, this big South African guy goes to Australia looks at the plant and says, shit, mm -hmm. I have it easier. <laughs> and did that fix the problem? Well, he came back, he called the sensei back. And the sensei didn't care, the sensei came and they started working together. That's, that's how the story got in the book. Gabor wants to know, how do you find the motivating factors in people for change? <coughs> Be more interesting. People join a company and leave their boss. This means you. We know that. We don't know what motivates people. It's a very personal thing. We know a few things. We know people join a company and leave their boss. We know people are demotivated when they don't see themselves progress. And we know that people hate, above all, that you don't recognize your, their efforts. That you reward somebody who's not doing anything, that you're being unfair while they're working their hard on. They hate that. So the only reason people work, if you're the head of anything, is they work for you. Yeah, you don't like it, you wish they worked for the job, or you wish, but they work for you. The work happens within your relation, relationship with them, within the mutual trust you've built with them. So the keys to people's motivation is you. Can you build a kind of team where they don't have to wear the company face? And in Lean it says, can you build a kind of team where, where they can tell you their problems and not get yelled at? Where your problems 
they can come to problems. They can come from with unfavorable information. They can come with information that doesn't go the way you want it. And you will discuss it, but you will hear it. You don't have to agree to everything. You don't even have to be nice about it. But they need to feel that you are hearing it. And then they will be part of what you're trying to do. Then the next step, of course, is saying to somebody who has an idea, let's do it. Who, uh, this is Hungary, so I don't know what kind of management bullshit you've heard. Who has heard that you should rephrase what somebody says? American companies, you know? I mean, come on, come on, come on. You steal that person's idea. You make it your own. They hate you. The only, the, the, there's no such thing as listening. There's only proof of listening. The only proof of listening is when somebody says something, I'd like to do this, and you say, we'll do what you say. You don't own it. You don't take it from them. You don't reframe it. So this is why in the factors I work with, when there are Kaizen ideas, we paint them yellow. It remains their property. They did this. So this is how you get people motivated. First, you're more interesting. You're more interested in them. You're more interesting. They want to participate to what you're trying to do. Secondly, when they do participate, you don't steal it from them. You say, even if it's not perfect, you'll correct it later, fine. You say, hey, good idea. Let's do what you say. And then you help them to make it happen. And you support them. Again, you, you make it happen. So you support them. So at the end of it, they still own it. And you're marrying them to the operation and to the company because they own a piece of it. And it's very simple. It can happen on very, very small stuff, but it's very powerful. Does any of this work when at the same time you're working people too hard and don't pay them enough? Next question. <laughs> Well, I'm sure you've had this one before, but it's an interesting one from Slido. If companies can be efficient with lean, could countries and governments benefit by using lean? Oh, that's another weird one. Why do you pick all the weird ones? Show, show me that. Show me that. I'm sure there. I'm sure there are easy ones. I need. I need to get my glasses on. Um, guys, no company ever benefits from lean. I don't know what a company is. Can you kick a company or shake its hand? You don't have lean companies ever. You have lean CEOs. You have individuals who practice lean. Okay? The moment this guy gets bought up or fired or promoted, what happens? Yeah, everything's down because the next guy is going to come up with no other ideas. Sure. There's no such thing as a lean company. There are some guys practicing lean. So, whether it's a very small people operation, whether it's a one billion company, whether it's a governance, so thank God we haven't seen that yet, but the size doesn't matter. What matters is the degree of practice that the, the CEO has or the boss has. So we have no idea if uh, it applies to government. Well, I guess prime ministers can't possibly have that much practice unless they're in a dictatorship, so then it doesn't work? We, we just don't know. We just don't know. We don't have yet a prime minister. That, but some things we do know, for instance, we know that some guys who have in there, they're never a prime minister level, but I can think of at least one person whose government now has a lean experience, and he's understood that it's not just about cost, but about quality. That sounds very simple, yeah? or a hospital director, it's already pretty big. So somebody very high up understands that it's not about costs, but it's about quality. And it's amazing to see the entire environment change. So again, this is why this battle is never won or never lost, because it can, it's really personal. It's, it, it's institutions are never lean or not lean. That doesn't make any sense. The people who run these institutions run them in a lean way or not. The, do you see what I mean? It's, it's, very it's, it, it's very practical, but it's not a religion. It's a practice. Any reason why you didn't start with developing standard work since it's the basis for generating Kaizens? It's a very lean question. I don't know. I don't you. like the way she chooses these questions. There you go. Now, what is the aim of the conference? <laughs> Okay, we did this one instead. Sure. Okay, guys, standard at work. Who, who here practices standard at work? Why are you asking? Nobody does. 
Show me hands. Standardized work. Standard work. Okay. This is your Taylorist condition expressing itself. Standard work comes from Japan. Japan has a notion of kata. There's a right way to do stuff. They're actually quite flexible. You go to a Japanese restaurant, there's a right way to serve tea, and then there's a right way to serve coffee. And you ask them something different, they're lost. <laughs> they're very good at moving from one right way to another right way. They just have this notion that there's a right way to do things. That what standard came from. We interpret standard as a rule, as a procedure, as what people should do. A standard work is not what people should do, it's what people should want to do. So yeah, of course I work with standard work all the time, but not in the way you think. I never apply standard work. Uh, the same thing, I say with people, it's like for instance, you're doing an interview here, you're doing your, your work as a journalist, I would ask, say, in this case, what would your standard be? Why do you give me all these dumb questions and ignore the, the, the interesting ones? This is interesting. Okay. And she says, uh, so this is the start of the conversation. The standard work is not, you should do the interview that way. This is, doesn't make sense. The conversation is, what should your standard be? And, and again, do, do you see the difference, guys? Do you see the difference? Say, you're not following interviewing standard. Not that you'd ever do this, yeah? To hear, hmm, what would a standard be? Do you see the difference? You're not face to face, you're side to side, you're looking at the piece of paper. And this is what completely changes a relationship. So all these lean tools are about stopping the face to face and putting yourself side to side so you look at the problem and then it makes perfect sense. Are you saying that works that, that works on the very basic physical level as well? That when you talk to people that work for you, you should actually be careful not to position yourself opposite? Yeah, that's what we do. The, the reason we do visual management is exactly this. Uh, okay, one of the key things of Lean is we take the CEO to the Gemba, to the right place. So we have people selling in front of the CEO. Well, then the CEO starts asking questions. Never, never, because then what happens is complete panic. So this in lean we would call lack of respect in terms of we're overburdening them. It's completely unfair for an operator to have to answer questions to a CEO. Do, do, you see the, do you see why? It's too much. So what we do is we create visual aids like this one, visual aids, and we will be like this with the guys and say, hmm, why does it change every second or so? And then the guy doesn't have to feel the pressure. He can talk to us. So yeah, that's one of the, the reason we visualize things, one of the reasons, there are others. But again, the first reason is to give people the tools to solve their problems themselves because they can see the time going on so they can calibrate themselves. The other reason is this, this is really important. You do not in lean talk to people head on. You, you avoid this confrontation. You move to the side and you look at something together do, do, can, can you see, guys? I'm, I'm not hearing responses. Does it, and, and this is great because here suddenly the, the hierarchical difference never goes away. The top guy is still the top guy. But in this conversation, we can talk. So we create a safe space to, to talk. Okay, I have a Michael Pleaser question here. Uh, Norbert wants to know Do you have any plans for a new book? And if so, can you share some insights with us? Yeah, that's pretty mean. Who, who wants to know? <laughs> hey, come on, I've just, I've just published one. I've just published a book called Lead with Lean in January, and I'm publishing one in, in June. Then you want more? <gasps> come on, literally no question is good enough for you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm still waiting I, for an interesting I, question. Yeah, I that's a very good point. That's a, come on, interesting question, anybody? Aren't they cute when they're like this? Look at them. So quiet. You do realize you already got them to not want to ask you any questions. But seriously, you, are, you do have a new book coming out soon. Yep. 
she's running to give you the cube. I'm sure we can make a story out of this. Yesterday we were shocked actually, so that was a big punch what we received from Michael, but uh, he mentioned that not to try lean at home. Oh God, no, <laughs> don't try lean at home. How you can live in this schizophrenic? situation. It's just work, guys. I remember back in the old days, there was a guy who did a 5S workshop. 5S, for, you know 5S? Oh, come on, tell me. you know 5S? You're still awake? Show me hands, 5S. Ah, oh. oh, so no, we are at the right conference. I was really worried for a second. So he did this show, he comes home, goes, sees his bathroom, and does 5S five, five in all his uh, girlfriend's uh, beauty products. The next thing he knows, he's got his suitcases at the door. <laughs> so that was a lesson, guys. <laughs> oh, ladies, do not do lean at home. Lean is just work. It, it's just work. It's not, it's not a philosophy. It's not a religion. It's not a cult. It's, it's just a way to work with people at work. I mean, there's, there's many things where we don't do lean. There's, there's actually many other interesting modern things that are not just lean. I, the mindfulness is one of the things that is coming up, and digital is another thing. I mean, it's, why would we bring everything down to lean? So don't do lean at home. I mean, uh, unless you really, really want to have it, get a divorce. And <laughs> that would come on, sure. What actually, I actually, one of the problems that happens when you do lean for a long time is is that if if you don't okay here here's another thing typically people miss about lean in the way our budgets are constructed we tend to overinvest to hide inefficiencies and to have overcapacity and then we squeeze the cost because the return on the investment is too small are you following me so we overinvest we cut the people and then nothing works. So the lean thing is completely different. We are very careful about capital cost, but it's okay to put people in the system to make work. So this is what you see in Japan. The stations are smaller, the trains run more, but they have more people to make sure the whole thing works. Just you know, it's a complete different balance between where you put the capital cost because you make a lot more money by reducing square meters and you worry less about people. Again, the other thing is that when you have less square meters, people are naturally more productive, so you win as well. So once you've practiced lean for a few years, you start seeing this, and believe me, you don't want to do it outside of work, because if not, you go completely crazy. <laughs> because everywhere you look at, you think, what are they possibly thinking? It drives you crazy. So no, don't keep lean at work. It's much safer, safer and saner. And what are the most common mistakes? We oh, we have a question. I Sorry. have a question uh, related to this, because the whole time we have been, the whole day was going quite well. Till, till this question came up that don't apply at home. Because every time when we start with the lean implementation, we always tell whatever you do in the office, also you can practice at home. And with my personal experience, whatever we do in the office, we also do at home, it works very fine. So Fascist. That, <laughs> that gives, <laughs> and leading with respect, I mean, it works very fine when you give personal examples to the people and it works successful at home, it works in the office. So it, this was very contradictory. That's why it provoked no, me to ask I, a question. D define works, <laughs> define works. What do you mean by works? Like in a garage, in my home, if I do 5S in my home, it works very fine. And in my bathroom or in my husband's bathroom, so it works everywhere. <laughs> so, <laughs> what do you I mean, find in your husband's clothes when you clean it up? <laughs> what I mean to say is that we cannot separate. No, no, I'm being very serious. I, I'm not being facetious. The, we we always can, try no, to be very careful. Okay. I'm very, I'm very being very serious. <laughs> There's no, pr the lean tools are very powerful. They will get, always guarantee you output, but not necessarily outcome. So uh, I was discussing with, um, oh shit, I can't, Sabolch, thank you guys. I was discussing with Sabolch, it turns out that maybe in Hungarian there's no different words to describe output and outcome. Who cares that lean works in your garage? Is this making you happier? If it is, do it, but you don't need lean, you just need to clean your garage. 
<laughs> again, the lean real 5S, I just saw in Japan, in fact, it was funny because it looked like a mess. This was real 5S, not your kind of 5S, real 5S. It looked like a mess because everything was put somewhere in the operator cycle that they could. Real 5S is about supporting the operator standard work. Do you do standard work in your garage? That's a bit weird. Do you do standard work in your bathroom? That's even weirder. Lean tools are very, very specific. We tend to generalize them. It's always a mistake. So let's go back to this difference between output and outcome. What are we looking for in using the lean tools? Somebody? No, this is a deep question. This is, thank you for the question. It's a very deep question, actually. What are we looking for using the lean tools? No. We're looking for opportunities for value analysis that will lead to opportunities for value engineering to deliver more value to our customers by, and lower your costs by doing less Moodle. We're not looking to solve everything. We're not looking to solve problems in general. We're looking for something very, very specific. We're looking to learn to learn. So we're looking to understand. In all the problems that we solve, we're looking to understand the easy problems and the hard problems. The hard problems are interesting. Not all the hard problems are interesting. We're looking for the problems that if we tackle them, and Toyota is su superbly good at this, they're incredible at this, that if we tackle these problems, we eventually end up with a factory that is 40% less uh, expensive to build. Things with high impact. But we are looking for them. That's the new book we work with Dan is about this. We find problems, then we face problems, then we form solutions with the people. We frame the problem so everybody understands and we form solutions with the people. So we're not interested in everything. So whenever, and I very rarely do simulations like I did yesterday, because whenever we do things out of context, we're actually confusing the issue for people. Because we're distracted them, because we tell them that it, it's not transferable. We tell them that every problem is the same, that the problem's in your garage. So sure, fine, they're going to clean up their office. But it's like, hey, uh, uh, anybody from R&D here? Nobody? Just shoo. Two. Didn't you have idiot consultants come in and ask you to sort your pens ever? No? Ta oh, Jesus. Can we shoot them right now? I mean, you're talking to engineers. The only thing you can do to have productivity from engineers is to get them to solve problems faster in the right way. Please explain to me how having the pens organized in the desk helps. It's just nuts. So, to be technical about it, you have a, when you start thinking about at home and at work, you have a huge transfer of problems, and you're actually misdirecting it. And this is the whole problem. And again, I'm not um, belittling the problem. It's, it's a huge problem. It's, lean is a scaffolding. We use a scaffolding for the building. We're human. We fall in love with the scaffolding. It's like looking at the finger that points at the moon and forgetting about the moon. So really, lean tools apply in a very local way because first we need to understand what is it we're looking for. And we are, unless, unless uh, and this is possible, unless a, hap, uh, unless a clean garage makes you really happier, it doesn't make sense. If it does, it does. Um, has Mary Kondo reached Hungary? Yes. All right, I love it. I love it. She's completely crazy. She's somebody who's made a career out of being neurotic. It's incredible. I wish I could do the same. <laughs> I'm neurotic enough, should, I should make a career out of it. But, uh, the, so Mary Kondo is all about cleaning your home. So people are saying, say, say, no, it's not sci-fi, this has nothing to do with 5S. It has to do with the personal pleasure some people feel, its value, about cleaning their homes. Do you see what I mean? It's not 5S, it's a home activity that you feel good about cleaning your home. Go for it. But please, but it will not transfer. It will at work if you if you get people to clean their kitchen or to get home. We've tried it. We really have tried it uh, for 20 years. It does not transfer to get people to find the right value analysis problem that would lead to interesting value engineering problem that would lead to innovation to get us better products. Th does that make sense? 
it's actually a quite a deep question here about, again, the use of the tools. One last question. There were a couple of references already at the workshop you did with some of these guys yesterday. What were your takeaways from that experience and from Hungary? I don't understand a thing about Hungary. <laughs> I'm not even sure where I am. Where are we? Uh, um, uh, takeaways from the workshop. You must do a lot of these all, all around the world. No, Is there a I, difference I, I, in I, I, how people approach the workshops and uh, actually the I don't I don't because um, because I actually the, the last question is a very deep question. I don't do the workshop because the workshop always works but doesn't necessarily teach the right thing to people. They don't necessarily go away with the right things. The other thing that happens, and this is a very smart question as well, the workshops are whatever the culture, the workshops are always the same. They always fall. Okay, for the guys, the guys who are not. What is the the first thing that happened in the workshop? It was funny. Come on, the first thing that, that we had a that we had a plant set up, you know, with different tables, and we have a room full of lean guys, and we're producing and we're producing one good part of a, out of out of ten. There's two things that happen. Some people, some people think that when you deliver nine good parts and one good part, you only have one part late. So no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> delivering parts, you count only the good parts delivered. And the second thing that happened is that everybody wanted to reorganize the flow so they could make more bad parts quicker. <laughs> well, the puzzling thing for me is that this happens everywhere. So, the takeaway for me is that Culture happens at lunch. Culture happens about political discussions. Culture rarely happens in Lean because I see exactly the same thing everywhere. This is far more technical than you think. When you start, and this is an interesting experience from Japan, when they started uh, trying to train American operators, they put them in lines with Japanese guys. So the Americans didn't speak a word of Japanese, the Japanese didn't speak a word of American, but they really wanted to solve the problem together. So when people really want to work together, culture disappears. When people have decided they don't want to work together, they get offended, they throw culture at you, they tell you here it's not the same. It's just they're just telling you that they don't want to work together to solve the problem. So, um, so two things about this question is like, first, I, I don't do this workshop very often because of the question we were discussing earlier about the 5S in the garage, because I don't know how it transfers. Because again, it, it orients it towards certain things in real life other things happen. Second thing, what is amazing is that for all, and I think you had the same experience, is the two things that happened that are funny in the workshop is that for all you guys lean experience, you couldn't, it's like, it's like these guys couldn't organize a piss up in a brewery. It's, it was amazing. I mean, you, you, you couldn't, do, do you agree? Every time you had all the theory, but every time it was a concrete situation with paper and tables, everybody was lost. So, but the striking thing, it happens everywhere, and in the same way. So, the takeaway is, is Josh here? Hey, Josh. The takeaway is actually more painful than I'm willing to admit, is that there is something seriously flawed in the way we teach lean. And we have taught lean, because it's the demand, in a very abstract way. And uh, people find, it, find me provocative or brutal, and I don't think I am. But one thing I am is I am very direct and very concrete. So most of the debate that we're having just don't make sense to me. Because in the workshop, what is funny is that we have tables and paper and people. And say, guys, just, you know, you know the basic lean rule, shut the fuck up, watch, learn, you know, there's like, yeah, it's happening here. And every, do you agree? Everybody's discussing, yeah, but what about? I don't know what about. I know here there's a table there. So, uh, so if there's one takeaway is that we are teaching lean in a too abstract manner. And we need to bring it back to what it was originally, which is a very, very pragmatic approach to creating value. And again, not value in a sense of value of something the customer really wants and by finding solutions. So we need to find the right problem 
and 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 as the ex-president of the U.S., he uh, would say, and don't do stupid shit. I mean, the, really, this is what it's about. Thank you very much, Michael. I think he deserves a round of applause. Thank you.